Today, we are in our highway series, and this is uh, the title for today, Hit the Road. And I wanted to show you this. This is the image that I used on the ad this week. And I used a pickup truck, number one, because I love pickup trucks, and I, I absolutely love old pickup trucks. But I used the pickup truck because I want you to know that whenever you take that step out, whenever you do the thing that God has called you to do and you actually get to the part where you're going to move, that you need a place to put your baggage because you are going to have baggage. God is not going to create a scenario that is perfect for you or me whenever we choose to step out. Uh, it, he just doesn't do that. He doesn't take all the baggage away and he doesn't take all the fear away. Um, but uh, we carry those things with us along the road until one by one God begins to take those things out of our lives and, and we overcome those certain. It was like the last series that we did um, called Summit Challenge. Uh, as he takes those things one by one out of our way, uh, we become unencumbered and we are able to walk uh, this path uh, and we're able to put aside those things that hinder us, those things that uh, weigh us down. And so I wanted to use that, I wanted to use that pickup truck uh, metaphor for that. And so today, we are going to talk about um, what it's like. I want, I want you to try to, to see it. I want you to try to feel it. I want you to try to experience what it is like to actually get to the place where you take that step out on the road. And sometimes those things are very difficult for us to do. Sometimes they're easy. Sometimes God calls us to do things that are not that hard for us to do. But then other times he calls us to do things that are very, very difficult. And so today I want to start with this scripture found in Matthew and this is Jesus in the garden. He has gone to the garden after the Last Supper. And he is with his disciples there. And he tells them to wait here. And he goes on and prays. And then he comes back. He came back to the disciples and found them asleep. And said to Peter, What could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you, fall, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Now, Jesus had already warned Peter that night, earlier that night. If you remember the story, he warned Peter and he, he said to Peter, uh, Peter said, I will die for you. I am willing to go and die for you. And he said to Peter, before this night is over, before the rooster crows in the morning, you will deny three times that you even know me. And so Jesus had already warned him. He knew that temptation was coming for Peter. And I always thought until this week that when Jesus said the spirit indeed is willing but the flesh is weak, I always thought that he was talking about himself. And I'm sure he may have been. But it could be that he was talking about Peter. Peter's spirit was willing. He, he wanted to go with Jesus. He wanted to follow Jesus. He wanted to... Uh, go to the death with Jesus, with Jesus if that was um, required. But Jesus said, you will deny me even three times tonight. And so he knew that, that uh, Peter was going to be weak in his flesh. Let's move on. Again, a second time, he went away and prayed saying, Oh, my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. So this time, he left them, he went away again, and he prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to his disciples and said to them, 
Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. This was happening right now. And then, I love this next line. He says, rise, let us be going. In other words, let us go. Let's go. Rise and let us go. See my betrayer, Judas, who Jesus dismissed from the table earlier that night, said, whatever it is that you have to do, go and do it quickly. He knew that Judas was coming. He knew that uh, Judas was going to bring the temple guards with him. He knew that, that he would be arrested. He knew all of the things that he would face. And he went to the garden because he knew that Judas would know where he was. He wanted to go to a familiar place where he knew Judas would, would find him. And while he was still speaking this, let us go, Judas, one of the twelve, with a great multitude, with swords and clubs, they came after him with swords and clubs, came from the chief priest and the elders of the people. So this was the this was the probably the there's no doubt this was the most important event of all of human history and all of human history. And Jesus just wanted his disciples to come and sit and watch and pray with him. He knew that this was the most pivotal point in all of human history, and he just wanted them to stay awake. He just wanted them to be with him, his companions, his friends, his very best friends. And yet they slept. This was not perfect. This was not a perfect scenario for Jesus he was disappointed that they slept. They did not understand the magnitude of what was about to happen. And so, uh, so Jesus uh, faced this decision in that garden that night alone with his father. And sometimes we face these decisions alone. I guarantee you there will come a time, if you walk long enough with Christ, if you walk long enough with God, if you make that first commitment, and usually our first commitment to follow Jesus is a quick one. You know, we hear this presented, the gospel presented to us, and it sounds good, it feels good, it's right because it's what we were created for. And, and so we, we hear that and we respond quickly. Usually that first commitment is the quickest commitment. It's in a moment. We make that decision. We answer an altar call or we uh, make a decision in a moment of need and we say, Lord, I'm committing my life to you. I want to follow you. And that's the quick one. But then if you continue to follow him, there will be tougher and tougher decisions down the road. And I guarantee you, you will face one of these moments where it's just you and God and you have to make a decision. And no doubt Jesus had prayed many prayers about this. He knew uh, what was going to happen to him. Uh, he predicted it. He prophesied it to his disciples. And there's no doubt that, that Jesus spent lots of time thinking about this. But the time came for him to step out and do it. And I've always said this, that the battle was won in the garden. That's where the battle was won. When Jesus stepped forward and he said, let us go, and he went out to meet the temple guards and his betrayer, Judas, when he walked out, when he put one foot in front of the other and he walked out to them, the battle was won. That's where it was won. And that's where we will win the battle. So this week, um, as I was planning this message, there was a word that I was going to, going to talk about today, and, and that is the word that we're going to talk about. But I did not put it in the email, if you read the email that went out this week. I did not put the word in the email, and I did not put the word in the ad. And so Lene read both the ad and the, the social media ad, and she also read the email. And she said, what are you, because I was, I was kind of given a teaser there. You know, and I wanted people to come and see what I was going to talk about today. 
And so I, I, I made those teasers without actually saying the word. And, and she said, what are you talking about this week? And I said, I'm talking about commitment. And she said, ooh. She said, when I hear that word, she said, it feels like a burden to me. And I realized when she said that, that this word means a lot of things to a lot of people. When you see this word, commitment, it evokes uh, a lot of different emotions in a lot of different people. When I hear that word, I think of achievement. I think of, of good things. I think of achievement. I think of um, character. I think of uh, something that is solid and firm and good commitment. It is good to commit to things. But my wife, Lene, is a servant. She was just born that way. She loves to serve. She serves our family. She serves her friends. She serves this church. She serves in every way that she can. It's just what she was made to do. And she loves to serve other people. No, nothing makes my wife happier than to serve someone else. Uh, whether it's going to a hospital room and just putting her hands on someone who is sick or even dying and praying for them she just wants to serve them and so she tends to say yes to everything and because of that she feels like if when someone comes to her uh, with all that she does someone comes to her and says can you commit to this it feels burdensome to her and so I don't know what, what this word means to all of you, but I, but I want to break this down into stages because this is a heavy word and it means a whole lot to a whole lot of different people. And this word commitment uh, can, can, be, it can be something that we do quickly, like I said before, or it could be something that is drawn out over w days and weeks and months, and in my case, years. And... And so I want to just break this down into stages. The first stage, when God is calling us to commitment, to commit to a certain thing, when he has gifted us and called us to a certain thing that is heavy, uh, often the process is something like this. We get the idea. We, we have a conversation with someone, and we get this idea that God may, might want us to do something. Maybe we are reading our Bible and we get this, this idea. Or maybe we see a need and the idea enters that way. That maybe there's something that we can do. Maybe it's something that really ties into our passion. Uh, the passion that we have. And we see a need and we see that we can meet that specific need. And it begins something like that. Um, and then we pray about it. We pray about it. We think about it. Uh, we do as the Bible uh, says, as the Scripture says, we count the cost. And we think about it. We go to people. Uh, and I would encourage you uh, to always seek godly, wise counsel whenever you're thinking about doing something big. But be careful. Be careful who you tell your dreams and your aspirations to. The, 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 be careful who you talk to about whatever it is you think God is calling you to do because it needs to be someone who has your best interest at heart. It needs to be a godly man or woman, and it needs to be uh, someone of the same sex, I would recommend. And it needs to be someone who can appreciate God's calling on your life. There's a scripture that says, do not cast your pearls before swine. You don't want to take something that's valuable and something that's precious, like this God-given dream or calling, and put it out in front of someone who's just not going to appreciate it and someone who's going to trample on it. So uh, be careful who you tell your dreams to, but seek wise counsel. And then you move into the planning stage. When you make this decision, hey, I want to move forward with this, then you move into the planning stage, and you plan, and you plan, and you continue to pray, and then there comes a day when you have to just pull the trigger. You have to say, okay, prayer time is over, thought time is over, it's time for me to act. And 
So then you act. And this is what Jesus did. I read a commentary about this this week. And, um, and it was uh, uh, the Barclay commentary. And he said, there came a time when Jesus' prayers ceased. In the garden, he prayed and he prayed and he prayed. And then his prayers ceased. And then he acted. And um, I learned a lesson several years ago, a couple of years ago, from my son, Hampton. He's my oldest son. And Hampton's always been quite an athlete. He was a skater. And for years, he was known at his school as a skater guy because he wore the skater clothes. You know, he had the skater hat and he had the skater uh, T-shirts and the, the pants and the skater shoes. And so he was one of those skater guys. And he skated I think he must have skated 24 hours a day. Is all he ever wanted to do was skate. We would sit at the kitchen table, and he'd have these little bitty uh, skateboards, these little toy skateboards, and he would, he would have it with his fingers, and he would be doing tricks on the, the kitchen table, and I would say, put that away, put that away. But he was always doing skater things. And so he learned a lot uh, by learning all these tricks and doing the things that I thought were just terribly dangerous to do but he, he did them and uh, he entered contests and he did very well as a skater and so a couple of years ago we uh, found out about this zipline course and we loved to zipline in my family and so we found out about this course down in Birmingham so Hampton and I were, went down to Bur Birmingham and we um, we went to this course and they had advertised this course uh, as an 80-foot tower, an 80-foot tower that we could zip line off of. And I just didn't believe it. I, I didn't believe that I thought they were just fudging the truth a little bit. I thought maybe it was a 40- or 50-foot tower, and they were just saying it was an 80-foot tower because we had been to several zip line courses, and we know, I know what, what a tall tower is that you zip line off. And we'd never been to anything that high. And so we, we got there to the place, and they put our harnesses on us and we went to the tower and we walked down the path until we got to this clearing and we looked up and I said oh no that is 80 feet that is 80 feet tall it was 89 feet tall to be exact uh, once we got up there the guy told us yeah it's actually 89 feet from the cable so as soon as I said okay let's go Hampton started running he ran up the stairs. The stairs went round and round this tower. Round and round until you got to about two-thirds of the way up. And then it was too steep to take the stairs anymore. You just had to climb ladders. So you would climb a ladder up to the, the next deck. And then you would climb a ladder from that deck to the next deck. And then you climb another. And at one point there was a rope ladder that we had to climb. And and Hampton, I'm just trying my best to keep up with him. And he is running up there with everything that he's got. And I get, finally get to the top. And I get there just in time. Just in time. I, 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 my head peeks up over that platform. And I see Hampton. He's, 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 his harness is already hooked up to the cable. And I get there just in time to hear the man say, Okay, you're good to go. And as soon as he said, good to go, Hampton ran off that platform. And I was amazed. I was so proud and so scared at the same time. Because I thought, this might be the day that Hampton finds out that I'm a weenie. Uh, and so I, I, I finally stand up. And by the time I stand up on the platform, and I'm exhausted, by the way. I'm in, completely exhausted. By the time I stand up... I see Hampton is halfway down the zip line, and this zip line is over the tops of the trees in, in the woods. And I see him disappear down through the canopy of those trees, and I see that this, this zip line is, you know, at least a quarter mile long. And so I, I had my harness on, and the man begins to hook me up to the cable, and I was not that quick. I had to go over to the edge, and I had to look over the edge, and I asked a lot of questions. Um, exactly how is this cable hooked to the platform? And, and, 
and so I asked a lot of questions. And then I, I, I had these two, two things that really convinced me that it was going to be all right. And that was that I looked at this cable and how long it was. And I realized this cable is thousands and thousands of pounds. And my little 175-pound self is not going to make a dent in that, uh, the weight of that cable. I'm not going to break the cable. And so uh, then I looked at my harness and I realized that, they were, that, that the harness had two pulleys on it. And so if one pulley broke, then there was still one more. You know, and, and I decided, okay, I'm going to go. And so I went. As I am ziplining down through the trees, Hampton is running back up the hill. And he says, it's great, Dad! It's great, Dad! And he runs back up the hill, runs back up the tower. And by the time they retrieve me off of this cable at the other end, Hampton's coming down again. He is, he is headed down the zip line again. And so as we both walked up the hill, he lapped me, you know, and, and as we're walking back up the hill, I get one more turn. He's done. And uh, I, I asked him, I said, how did you do that? I said, I thought you would be a little bit scared. And he said, well, he said, I learned in skating. He said, whenever I'm doing something that fit, that's out of my comfort zone, something that's dangerous, whenever I'm doing something like that and I have to kind of get my nerve uh, he said, I go ahead and I make my decision. I, I ask the questions, I think about it, and I decide. And once I decide, it's over. He said, then all that's left to do is to just do it. And he said, when I got to the top of the, the tower, he said, if I had looked over the edge and thought about it, I would have been scared. He said, but I didn't think about anything except go. That's all I thought about. When I get to the top of that tower, all I want to do is go. And that's exactly what he did. And uh, I was so proud of him. But I learned something that day. And, um, and that's exactly what I did when I got to the top of the tower the second time. I just went. And let me tell you, it was so much fun. I loved doing that zip line off that tower. It was the most fun I've had in so, in so long. And, and so sometimes you just have to go. Sometimes you just have to pull that trigger and go. The most difficult decision that I have ever had to make was the decision to start this church. Now, I've told this story before, and if you've heard it, I apologize. Uh, but it's a very good story, and you, sh you should probably listen again. Um, so, Lene and I knew that we were going to start this church for years. The past five years, we really were concentrating on it. We were really praying about it. We were in this first stage of, uh, you know, praying about it. And in the last year, we asked some friends, some people that we trusted. We asked them to pray with us about this. We went out to dinner with two or three different couples. And we had people that were in ministry, godly people, uh, wise people, people that we trusted. We asked them, to, would you please pray about this? And so that last year, we, we had other people praying, and then we were, uh, we were planning. We were planning that last year. We were putting everything that we knew how to do in place so that we could make this move. And we knew that it was going to cost us just about everything financially. We knew that. And, uh, and we had to make that decision. Are we willing to make that decision? Are we willing to sacrifice this much for what we believe God is calling us to do? And it was a hard decision to make because when, when I contemplated leaving where I was to come out to a place that I did not know that was one of the most frightening things that I've ever faced. Because I didn't know that you would be here. I didn't. I didn't know that we would be in a place like this. But God has blessed us. And I didn't know that we were going to have so many serious, uh, uh, committed people here at this church. And, 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 and so it was scary for me. And the night, I remember the night... Uh, I was up late because I had to go into work the next day and I knew that I had a decision to make and we had this we have this um, 
footrest in front of our sofa in our den. And that night I was leaning over that, that uh, footrest and I was praying for hours. And about two o'clock in the morning, uh, I said, Lord, just give, me a, just give me a word. Just give me something. I know you've spoken to me. I know this is what you want me to do. But push me over the edge if this is what you want me to do. Because I cannot afford to make a wrong decision here. And this is what I heard at 2 o'clock in the morning. It was God's voice to me. And it was in the form of a question. And this is what he said. He said, where is your future? Where is your future? And it took me about two minutes to make that decision. Because I knew that my future was not where I was. I knew that it wasn't there. I didn't know what was out here. But I knew that my future was not back there. And so I got up. When I heard that word, I got up. The decision was made in my own heart. I went to bed, got up the next morning, got dressed, came into the kitchen where Lene was working, and I had my coat on, and she said, where are you going? And I said, I'm going to quit my job. And she said, whoa. She said, wait a minute. Uh, shouldn't we pray about this? And I said, well, you know, I said, you know we've already prayed about this and she said I know she said do you feel that this is what God wants you to do and I said this is what he spoke to me last night where is your future where is it and you and I both know it's not here and so I'm going to make this move and by lunchtime the word was out I was starting a church and I was leaving the place where I was where I was comfortable where my family was comfortable and I was starting a church and it's been, it's been one blessing after another, and almost every one of those blessings are sitting right here in this room. It has been one blessing after another. And I want to tell you that no matter how hard it is, no matter what God calls you to do, no matter how hard, how, no matter how difficult it is, no matter how scary it is, and I will say this to you, that God does not take the fear away. And He does not take the fear away on purpose. Because the, the answer to our fear is to just do it. Courage is not the absence of fear. It is determination in the face of fear. You want to overcome your fear? Determination in the face of fear. Staring that fear down with the Holy Spirit behind you is the way to conquer that fear. I, I know this more than I know any other spiritual truth. I know this. That, that is the way to conquer your fear. He will not take that fear away. And it is not courage if you are not afraid. There's a movie several years ago called, I think it was called Bounce. It starred Ben Affleck, and his character made this statement in the movie. It said, he said, it's not brave if you're not scared. And that is the truth. So don't think that God's going to take the fear away. Don't even pray for him to take the fear away. Pray that he will give you the inner strength and the, the commitment to look that fear in the face and move ahead. And that's what I had to do. And I do not regret it. And I want to tell you that it is worth it. Every time I sit down with someone who is serious about their faith, and it happens every week. Every, every time I sit down with someone who is serious I mean, they want to spread the kingdom in this city. And they want, to, they want to be a part of this. Every time I see someone who wants to follow Jesus through this life and into eternity, every time I see that, uh, it just confirms once again it was worth it. I'm so glad that I stepped out. I'm so glad that God gave me a wife who stepped out with me. I'm so glad that this happened. And so my question to you today, whether your challenge, whether your next step with God is small 
or whether it's big, whether it's easy or whether it's the most difficult thing in the world, I just want to ask you this question. Where is your future? <laughs>